Today, I am very excited to introduce Sohaila Homeyed here um, to speak with us. Sohaila is the Program Manager of Rural Immigration for the Rural Development Network. So with that, I'll turn it over to our featured guest. Thank you so much, Alicia. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's session. Um, our topic will be on rural immigration. And as Alicia mentioned, my name is Sohaila. I'm the Program Manager for the Immigration Team at the Rural Development Network. I've been with RDN for about three years now, uh, working across rural Alberta and Northern Ontario uh, to support employers, rural communities, and newcomers um, with the attraction, retention, and settlements you know, across rural communities. I'd also love to do my own personal land acknowledgement. Um, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people uh, across Turtle Island. As an organization, you know, RDN acknowledges that we are all treaty people, and what we call Alberta is the traditional and ancestral territory of the Blackfoot, Cree, Dene, Salto, Nakota Sioux, uh, the Métis, and the Stony Nakota, uh, sorry, the Sioux-Tina Nation people of Alberta. We acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit who have lived in and care for these lands for generations. So for those of you who are unaware of RDN, we're a nonprofit organization founded on supporting rural communities in their efforts to address social issues across Canada. We understand that many rural communities have very unique needs, challenges, and opportunities that differ from urban centers. And this is often because the realities, you know, of living rural, um, they can, um, you know, oftentimes um, the social and economic structures and the infrastructure that exists or sometimes don't exist um, that appear in many smaller communities. So we're here to support. Uh, and we support communities uh, in a multitude of different ways. So first and foremost, we create innovative tools and resources, uh, including, you know, different guides, toolkits, and trainings that are created in partnership with rural communities and organizations and are specifically designed for rural communities. So we really like to include that rural lens in all the work that we do. We also provide expertise and boost the capacity of communities to implement their own projects. We advocate on behalf of rural stakeholders and help to connect people to resources and information through different events and networking opportunities. And finally, we support groups with accessing funding and communities to be able to access funding to meet their organizational or their greater community goals. We have very different uh, initiatives at RDN. So as mentioned, I work for the rural immigration team. We support with the attraction, retention and settlement of newcomers in rural communities across Canada. We also have a rural revitalization team, and they look at community development through a holistic lens um, that integrates different social and economic issues. Um, as we know, they're often very interconnected. We also uh, do homelessness. So we provide estimations on what homelessness looks like in your community, and we help to administer the federal reaching home funding for rural uh, homelessness initiatives across um, Alberta. We also do policy development. So at an organization and municipal level, we help to assist with policy development that creates the outcomes that communities wish to achieve with their housing, homelessness, immigration, and indigenous engagement strategies. In addition, uh, we do different networking and event opportunities. We love to connect rural municipalities with stakeholders and different networks that assist with collaboration and working together. We also have an Indigenous engagement team. Um, we actually currently have a First Nations-led First Nations data collection project to measure the different uh, levels of homelessness in um, Indigenous communities. And we also have an Indigenous liaison who supports RDN with all of our engagement work um, and to create that Indigenous lens on all of our projects and with all the communities we work with. Uh, and finally, we have a sustainable housing team, and our sustainable housing initiative helps communities to determine their different housing needs um, through different needs assessments and housing strategies, while also providing assistance to organizations and communities to be able to access funding to support those needs assessments. So we know that, you know, housing is a major issue across Canada, so we're really hoping to provide that support on both the organizational level and the community level as well. So I just want to start off um, today's session with 
um, a true or false. You can write it in the chat uh, or, you know, unmute your microphone. But um, true or false, in 2022, immigration accounted for 50% of population growth in Canada and 75% of Canada's labor force growth. So some folks said true, and it's actually false. So in 2022, immigration accounted for 75% of population growth and 100% of Canada's labor force growth. So as we know, immigration plays a large role in our communities and in our workforce development. And in order to meet the needs of newcomers in our towns and in our workforces, we have to inform community members like yourself and different employers on strategies on how to welcome newcomers, but also how to retain them in our rural communities. I have one more for you. So true or false, the main reason a newcomer will often remain in your community is due to uh, access to language assistance. I'm looking in the chat here. Yep, some folks said false. So you're correct. Um, the main reason a newcomer will stay in your community is that feeling of connectedness and belonging. So it's important to support newcomers in feeling welcome, both in the workplace and in the community, as well as with their families. So doing simple things like um, having a buddy program, supporting with transportation, hosting potluck dinners, and opportunities for newcomers to connect with one another and feel that sense of belongingness will be main reasons why newcomers want to stay in your community. So I just wanted to begin by talking about the landscape of immigration in Canada. So, you know, in 2022, we saw 400,000 permanent residents uh, across the country and um, 700,000 temporary residents. Those were huge numbers um, adding to our population growth as a nation. And this year alone, we see 485,000 permanent residents and even more so in the next year. So this is just to say that immigration is a huge determinant of our population growth, but also our labor force growth as well. And we're continuing to open our doors and welcome newcomers and rural communities are the perfect place to do that. In Alberta alone, um, the governments, both federal and provincial, have instilled several different immigration programs to support the attraction of newcomers to our rural communities. So we've seen the launch of the Rural Renewal Stream, the Rural Entrepreneur Stream, to try and get newcomers to see rural communities as their future home and to want to stay and live in our small towns. We've also seen the development um, of the Rural and Northern Immigration Program, RNIP, and most recently, the Alberta Tourism and Hospitality Stream. So these are just initiatives um, that show the importance of immigration. The government sees this as an opportunity to help grow our towns um, and as well as the importance that immigration has, you know, to all spheres of our economy. So I wanted to talk a little bit about understanding the needs of newcomers in rural communities. So we like to talk about the needs um, similar to Maslow's hierarchy. So when newcomers first arrive to our small towns, they're going to need to access basic needs. So shelter, um, housing, and employment. Those are kind of the bottom ladder of that hierarchy. Once they have those initial needs met, they're going to have more diverse needs that will help both of the settlement and the retention uh, in the community. So newcomers will require things like language and employment support. Um, oftentimes, you know, newcomers come here with various different degrees. Um, I'm sure several of us here today know of a doctor or a nurse who moved to Canada hoping to continue their career. Uh, but unfortunately, there were many challenges and barriers that, um, you know, allow them to try a different career. And oftentimes, individuals uh, end up taking survival jobs. So once they have those survival jobs, they're going to want to have more career counseling and opportunities to grow and start something new. So that's where that language uh, and employment support really uh, come in handy. They'll also require, you know, different social networking opportunities. So as I mentioned, that feeling of connection and belongingness are really important. And for newcomers to feel like they can connect, they're going to need opportunities too. So whether that be in the workplace, whether that be community events, uh, it's really important uh, for newcomers to, you know, make friends and start to grow in their communities. They also will probably require a cultural orientation. So oftentimes, you know, just getting oriented to life in Canada, um, especially the weather, you know, um, understanding what life in rural communities could be like, because oftentimes, you know, we see a lot of people moving to small towns who might not have come from a small town originally. So adapting to not only Canadian culture, but also those uh, unique um, qualities of living in rural communities. 
They will also need access to affordable and culturally safe housing. So sometimes we see uh, families who come in with uh, different generations and they'll require larger housing to be able to support, you know, a mother-in-law or, um, you know, a family who have a large amount of kids. So having access to housing that can support families of that size is really important as well. Um, having access to healthcare and transportation is huge. Um, you know, sometimes our small towns don't have, um, you know, opportunities to see a healthcare provider, but there are healthcare providers in nearby cities. So newcomers need to know exactly how that works, uh, where they can go, how they can get transported, things like that. There's also that baseline understanding of uh, the Canadian systems. So what does the school system look like? Um, what does the law system look like? What does the transportation system look like? So they'll need to get oriented into those different uh, systems as well. Uh, something that's huge for newcomers um, that's not really spoken about very much is the financial literacy piece. So um, employers will often take this on themselves, but it's also important you know, for newcomers to get that financial literacy, whether through a settlement organization, whether through um, you know, a friend or someone else in the community that can support them in understanding uh, these different layers. We can also see um, you know, some of the barriers that newcomers experience. And by knowing these barriers, we're we're able better to address them and create more welcoming and inclusive environments to help meet newcomers where they are and address those needs. So we like to refer to them as the five C's, um, and arguably actually the six C's. Uh, so the first C uh, that you see here is color. Color um, talks about barriers related to race and appearance, um, especially seen in smaller communities where there might be a lack of diversity. That color can be a huge barrier for a newcomer coming in here, hoping to connect to a cultural community, hoping, hoping to maybe access some cultural foods that aren't available uh, in their small town. So that cultural barrier is, is huge. There's also cultural confusion. So this is a big barrier which occurs sometimes when newcomers come and they have one expectation of what Canada may be like. And then after their arrival, um, their expectation is very different. So um, this can occur a lot of times for immigrants who are hoping to come here and pursue their education uh, or their careers that they had in their home country. Um, and they're realizing that life in Canada might be a little bit different than what they anticipated. So navigating that cultural confusion um, and also trying to balance, you know, the culture they're bringing from their home countries while adapting to a new culture as well. That's um, that's very challenging for newcomers in the first few months upon arrival. Um, number three, I'm sure no one's surprised by this, but climate. <laughs> it's often shocking for newcomers to come here, um, you know, especially during the winter months, trying to adapt to Canadian weather. But then all the other things that come with the climate. So learning how to drive in the winter, learning about different deficiencies in your body when the winter comes, uh, learning about, you know, what proper clothing to wear and to send their children to school in. So all those additional barriers that might come with trying to navigate the, the weather system here. Sure. Computers. Um, this is a big one too, uh, that technology piece. So we're also seeing this um, with some elder Ukrainians who are coming in who might not um, have access to computers. Um, this is especially true for rural communities who don't have settlement agencies in their towns. So sometimes uh, newcomers have to go to the library or use computers to be able to access those settlement services in the bigger cities. And um, this can be a huge challenge uh, for newcomers who might not have access to technology um, or who might struggle a little bit more with that computer side. So that's a big barrier as well. And we often see this in remote places where, you know, there's just no settlement agency nearby, there's no transportation available, and newcomers have to access, you know, their basic settlement services virtually. We saw that a lot during COVID. And now we're seeing that as well, you know, as more communities are welcoming newcomers, and they might live in a remote location. Uh, number five is communication. So not being able to converse with people due to language barriers, that can often lead to a lot of frustration, uh, feelings of isolation, and missed opportunities as well for newcomers. Um, I would add a 6C, which is connection. Uh, as mentioned several times this morning, newcomers need to feel that connection piece to be able to successfully integrate into both the workplace and community. So they need to feel like they have that connection at work, um, they have good relationships with their employers, but also with their neighbors um, and their communities. And that's something that rural communities are really good at is that small knit 
uh, closeness that, you know, you know your neighbor. So it's really important uh, that newcomers feel that sense uh, of opportunity as well when navigating, you know, a new country. I also really love to mention intersectionality, and I'm not sure if folks on the call here today uh, or watching this video know intersectionality, but um, it's uh, a theory that was actually uh, coined by this really incredible uh, civil rights activist named Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989. And this refers to the concept that um, intersectionality is a way to think of our identities and how we experience the world. So it merges different identity markers like race, class, gender, sexual orientation, um, culture, and those intersections really influence our power and privilege in society. And I like to mention this because I do believe that living in a rural community is an intersection, but also being a newcomer to a small town is an intersection as well. So if you can imagine, um, these intersections can really play a huge role in how welcoming newcomers might feel in our small towns. It also plays a huge role in you know, the racism and discrimination that they might feel, whether in our communities or in our workplaces. And you know, just an important note that you know, a newcomer who moves to a small town from Ukraine, a newcomer woman, might have different settlement experiences than a newcomer male from Mexico. And those are all due to the different intersections. So when we consider those intersections that a newcomer might experience, uh, whether it be a new mom who just moved to Canada and she's having a child and she needs to access a healthcare system, but there's a language barrier. So thinking about things like this can really help us not only improve our connection with newcomers, but also our services and how we approach different situations uh, with newcomers moving to our towns um, and being part of our uh, communities and our workplaces. So supporting rural communities across Alberta. So now I just want to talk a little bit about some strategies that you can implement in your community or even in your workplace to help with successful attraction, retention, and settlement. So the first thing that we really like to tell communities and, you know, even an employer, the step zero is measure your current capacity. So before you're willing to open your doors to welcoming newcomers, we want to challenge you to think, you know, what does your current climate look like? What types of diversity exist in your community? Um, what relationships have already been established between cultural groups? So do you have a lot of individuals from a certain cultural group that might be able to support newcomers when coming to move to your town or in your organization? What supports are available to help newcomer employees or newcomers in general in your community? So do you have settlement services available? Do you have access to health care? If not, where can newcomers go to access those services? Um, what efforts are being done to promote inclusion? So do you have any kind of committee or organization in your community of volunteers to help support newcomers in navigating, you know, the first few months in Canada? Do you have something similar in your organization? And what are your short, short term and long term goals? So, um, you know, what are you hoping to achieve? Are you hoping to welcome 40 newcomers to your community um, and start employment and be gone in four years? Or are you hoping to welcome newcomers, have them stay, grow their families and be part of the community for the long term or even in your organization? So it's important to think about what your goals look like and then how you can achieve those goals. So step zero, measure your current capacity. Step one uh, really revolves around attraction. So, um, you know, leverage your informal networks. So oftentimes, you know, a lot of newcomers who come to Canada and Alberta, they think of the major cities in Alberta, Calgary, Edmonton, some come to Fort McMurray, um, just those larger centers that boast more uh, cultural diversity. So it's important to leverage your informal networks by showcasing, you know, come to our small town. Uh, here, there's, here's the reasons why you might want to come. A lot of that can be done through employers, but also leveraging some of those informal networks that you might not think about. So housing groups and Facebook groups, those are huge. Um, if you have housing in your community, there's a 99% chance that someone will want to move there just to be able to have access to a home. So uh, advertising that, advertising on Facebook, connecting with different cultural groups on Facebook, um, and also settlement organizations as well. Those are huge opportunities for you to showcase uh, your community or even your workplace. 
utilizing UMTAP newcomer groups. So um, there's a lot of Ukrainian evacuees coming to Alberta, and there's also international students that I think a lot of people don't really think about when they think of newcomers. And international students are hoping to get a great education in Canada, uh, stay here, uh, grow their families, and make really good career opportunities. So if you're an organization in a, in a rural community hoping to attract workers, um, utilizing these untapped uh, newcomer groups uh, can be really great to fill your talent pipeline, but also to grow your diversity in your community as well. Incentivizing staff. So um, referral programs too for, for your staff to be able to bring in newcomers uh, or bring people to your community is really good. Um, and I'll often use the word community and employer really interchangeably throughout the session because uh, I believe that employers play a huge role in the attraction and settlement of newcomers, especially to small towns. Um, so employers can play a huge role in that attraction piece, but also can play a huge role in why newcomers want to stay and grow their families in our small towns. Also, culturally competent hiring practices. So, um, you know, being able to meet newcomers where they are, maybe that's through the orientation process, uh, maybe you know, your workplace wants to give a really good orientation of the community, show a newcomer where they can go and get their documents, uh, where they can get their groceries, things like that. So those extra steps that you might take. Um, and then, you know, small towns, word of mouth, you might have a really good experience integrating a newcomer family and they tell their family abroad or in a different town. And that's how you really see that attraction piece growing in small towns. So step two is settlement. Um, understanding the needs of newcomers in your community. So understanding exactly what newcomers might need when moving to your town is important because then you can address those needs. If you know that newcomers need access to healthcare, uh, you can support them by showing them where they can access healthcare. Maybe they need translation services. Um, maybe they're looking on how to register their children in school. So by first understanding and identifying those needs specific to your community as well, uh, you'll be able to meet those needs and support newcomers in their settlement process. Uh, establishing strong referral networks. So if you are a rural community or an organization and you do you are remote and there are no uh, settlement agencies in your town, having those strong referral networks can really go a long way. Knowing where to support your employee um, or you know someone in your town, knowing where to refer them if they're looking for immigration support, settlement support, any of the above, um, that can really support with their settlement experience. Check-ins and community tours. So we often say this a lot to employers, um, but the same can go on a community level as well. Um, a newcomer will probably need more frequent check-ins than you know someone that you might have hired from the community. So oftentimes uh, an employer might do a performance review and the same can be done uh, on the newcomer level, but more frequently. So I've worked with employers in the past who have done, you know, after the first week, a little sit down talk with their employee or employees to see how their first week went and then their first month and then their first three months and then their first six months. And it's a little bit more effort up front, but you're really able to form a good connection and bond with your staff and address problems when they arise. So sometimes you don't want to wait three months before you know that someone's having an issue they don't have enough money for groceries. They need winter clothing for their children. By establishing those frequent check-ins, you're able to address issues when they come up instead of prolonging them. Um, and that can really help with that settlement experience as well. And community tours are really great too. Just showing, you know, here's our grocery store. Here's where you can go to the pharmacy. Um, this is, you know, a local legends house that, um, you know, they've been around for so long and they're able to support you with this. So just those personal touches uh, I find are really important too for that settlement experience and they make newcomers feel included. Getting the community on board and advocacy is also, you know, really huge. Uh, sometimes there's a lot of pushback from community members on wanting newcomers to come. And um, this is, I, I believe, everyone's responsibility, but really showcasing that newcomers are such a good benefit for our communities. They diversify our economy. They bring innovation and creativity to the workplace by really taking on that lens and promoting newcomers through a positive lens can really help more community members getting on board. For in Claire's home, they were uh, an RNF community, and um, I had a discussion there with their RNF coordinator, and he was really great. He said, you know, the community had a lot of pushback because they had a lot of questions. They didn't really know what would happen um, to the town, and um, 
he sat down, he had an open discussion, he brought council members in, and he allowed community members to come in and talk about their concerns. And he sat down and he answered all the questions, and he thought that it was a really good way to promote um, and, and dispel a lot of myths that might, you know, come from people thinking about newcomers coming to the town. But it also created a really positive environment to promote the importance of newcomers and how they can help support the economy, the social fabric of our small towns, and why evidently they're important um, for uh, our labor growth. So that was a really good experience. Um, and I highly recommend as an organization as well, if you're an employer and you're having pushback from staff, to really you know, open the floor to address questions and any concerns they may have, and also promote you know, that you know, newcomers are human beings. Um, they have really interesting stories. And if you promote those positive aspects, you'll more, more likely get a really good response in return. Uh, lastly, supporting with initial settlement needs. So uh, some communities have welcoming and inclusive committees that you know, their whole role is just volunteering to support with newcomers who come to the community, uh, working with employers is huge too. So sometimes employers will opt to support with those settlement costs. And we'll see an example um, in a little bit about an employer who has done things really good and really uh, inclusively. But um, working with employers is huge, as I mentioned, and creating a, a committee with different stakeholders. So, you know, someone from the school board, someone from the town council, someone from the housing um, sector, it's really important to get everyone in the community on board, and that will create a more welcoming and inclusive environment across all different stakeholders uh, and levels in your community. Lastly is retention. Um, so I always say that successful settlements uh, equals successful retention. So if someone feels really settled and happy um, and they had a really good experience settling into their new home and their new work, they're more likely to stay. Of course, there will be newcomers who come and they might leave for various reasons, but there will be a handful who do stay uh, because they feel so welcomed and because their new town feels like home. So promoting an inclusive work environment, uh, accepting all types of diversity, that's really important too. Um, I often say that, you know, you could create the most welcoming and inclusive community, but if things aren't inclusive in the workplace, newcomers will leave and vice versa. If you have a really inclusive workplace, but the community is really negative and you're not having a good experience, newcomers will, will leave as well. So creating that inclusivity in the workplace and the greater community is the ultimate goal for retention. Opportunities for advancement in the workplace as well. So as I mentioned, you know, a lot of newcomers might have those survival jobs to meet their initial needs at first, but they're going to want opportunities to advance in their career and get that recognition. And by providing those opportunities and showcasing that newcomers can grow in your organization and in your community, that will support retention initiatives as well. As mentioned, belongingness is huge. Um, employee incentives, so creating opportunities for growth um, and for employees to want to stay in your organization, that's big as well. Supporting with permanent residency applications uh, that applies to your organization, that's really big as well. Um, if you're a rural renewal community, supporting uh, newcomers um, with their endorsements, that will be really great for retention. And then work-life balance. So, um, you know, providing opportunities for newcomers uh, or newcomer employees to connect with the greater community, to have opportunities to connect with different groups uh, is really important uh, for that retention piece. I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to go a bit quick, but I, I have three small case studies I want to showcase. Uh, the first is Vegreville, um, and I'm showcasing Vegreville because their response to welcoming Ukrainians has been incredible. Uh, historically, Vegreville has had a large Ukrainian population, but once we've started seeing thousands of Ukrainians coming to Alberta, Vegreville really stepped up um, and they were able to support uh, with a lot of those settlement and integration pieces in their community. So um, they had a large you know, influx of Ukrainian evacuees um, and that was mostly through you know, Facebook groups, word of mouth, WhatsApp groups. They were able to get the community together. Uh, now 1.7 of their population is now Ukrainian evacuees, which is huge. Um, but something that I thought was really unique and creative was that they created a response committee uh, for different members in their town. So town council came together and they said, we need to be able to support, support these Ukrainians who can help. So they had members uh, of the Ukrainian community step up of the church. 
they had housing providers step up and say, we're able to offer these units, we'll waive, um, you know, any kind of financial records that they may need for the first three months. Employer stepped up and said, these are the job opportunities that, you know, we're looking to recruit for. They had a team of people uh, doing fundraising. So when newcomers, uh, when evacuees came to the town, they were gifted with a little care package from the town with, um, you know, information on um, job opportunities. They had a gift card to buy groceries. There was a donation center available specifically for evacuees to be able to get clothing and necessities needed. Uh, People donated furniture. So it was just a really good example of how a community really came together different stakeholders um, at different levels to support these evacuees. And because of this, you know, a lot of newcomers and evacuees are going to stay in that small town. They're going to build their families um, and they feel really supported. So I thought this was a really good example of what to do when, you know, there's a little bit of a crisis and and the Ukrainian evacuees coming, um, you know, no one really had a plan, but the community really came together to decide, you know, what they wanted to do and many people supported. Um, A lot of fundraising is still being done because, as you know, more Ukrainians are still coming. And uh, that continued advocacy piece was also really important to get people to still be engaged. So there's still families offering to host um, newcomers for the first couple of weeks. There's still initiatives being done today to continue that support, which I thought was really unique. Another community that I want to highlight is Hinton. So Hinton um, is a designated renewal stream community, and they were designated November of 2023. And just this year, um, sorry, 2022, and just in January of last year, they were able to launch their program. So they have now over 150 endorsement letters for newcomers and over 50 participating employers, which is huge for a small town. Um, Something that was unique to Hinton that I wanted to mention is that The renewal stream um, uh, was launched with very little guidelines about, you know, what communities can do. And it was often trial and error about how communities would navigate this. So Hinton had to put a lot of thought into, you know, what they were going to do to support workers, but also protect them um, from employers who might take advantage of them. So they created a terms of reference um, that was really awesome because it allowed Uh, employers to follow a certain set of rules that they had to abide by uh, to be able to um, participate in the program. So that protected the rights of the workers to not get, um, you know, used and taken advantage of. And it provided incentive for employers to maybe get that cultural awareness training that they needed um, or to provide training for staff um, and just do that, go that extra mile to create more inclusive work environments. So they reached out to different nonprofit agencies. Um, They had housing, employment, the school board all come together. They have a rural renewal stream committee now. uh, And as I mentioned, different stakeholders sit on it. Um, And what's really great too, is they have opportunities for employers to get together. So they have every three months, uh, these breakfasts where they host with um, the employers from uh, the renewal stream come together they get some free training about, you know, either cultural sensitivity or meeting the needs of newcomers um, to be able to build those capacities of workplaces in the community. On another note, they also have opportunities for newcomers as part of the program to get together. So they have networking opportunities for newcomers to network with each other, but also with employers in the community. So I thought that was a really unique way of getting people, um, you know, to come together, create those areas of connectedness and belongingness and provide opportunities for different stakeholders to come in to meet newcomers, um, to discuss what opportunities might exist in the community. And that can also help with that advocacy piece as well, creating more welcoming and inclusive environments, um, opportunities for newcomers to to meet their neighbors and, you know, feel like they belong in their small town. Uh, Another uh, opportunity that I wanted to talk about was Santerra Farms. And this is more on the organizational level. Um, It's where I just saw a message in the chat had over 180 RRS approved in Drayton Valley. That's amazing. Congratulations. Um, So Santerra Farms, uh, I've had the opportunity to work with them for a few years and they are incredible. Um, They have the greenhouses, they have uh, the meat packing plant um, and they were able to hire and retain, you know, over 40 temporary foreign workers. And what I've really 
appreciated and enjoyed from Sentara was their approach to supporting um, uh, newcomer employees in a unique way. So they were able to buy housing in Acme and um, have newcomers live there for the first three months while coming to Canada to be able to get enough money to rent a place. Um, they also provided daycare for their staff. So I know um, if you're an employer in a rural community, you might not have the funds to do this, uh, but they were able to hire, you know, one of the staff members' daughters and a few of uh, other workers to just have a daycare in place. So when staff went to work, they knew that their children were safe. Um, they had um, they could come in at weird hours. It was a really good opportunity to provide that extra opportunity. And this was mostly uh, for newcomer employees. So it was a good incentive. Children got to know each other. Parents got to talk to one another. So it was a really good initiative, I think, that really supported families um, of these workers. They also created really unique orientation onboarding experiences for their newcomers. So they had a member of their HR team work directly just with the newcomer employees. So learning about the different cultural customs of these um, different newcomers coming in, they did tours of the community, they did facility tours, and they were able to sit down and talk things through um, about, you know, what is it like to file a tax? What are the expectations in the workplace? So um, if you start work at nine in the morning, we expect you to be here at 8 30. Um, just like here's the lunch room. This is where you put your lunch. So doing those extra small things to really help newcomers feel like they understand the workplace um, and the greater community as well. That was really important. They also had the opportunity to hire translators to support um, with some of their staff. So they have a really large Filipino community who works uh, in the in the meatpacking industry. So they were able to hire translators, get some documents translated. What they also did was um, they created safety videos that were done um, online and they were done in English. And it was mostly just, um, you know, showcasing, you know, some of the safety procedures that, uh, and the video could be translated in different um, languages. And that really supported newcomers who were visual learners, but also, you know, to see things, um, you know, live instead of having to read a manual, which can often be time consuming and confusing. So they created these orientation videos that were wildly successful, that could be translated, that newcomers could sit down during the orientation and watch things and rewatch them instead of having that burden of reading manuals. So that was a really good uh, opportunity as well. Santera also connected with uh, surrounding uh, Nihil, um, the Nihil Adder Learning Center, providing settlement supports for their newcomers, um, and just had that dedicated staff person who is there to meet the needs of their employers. So really good case example of an organization who did things really good. Um, and I had the opportunity to work with them. So, so if anyone has any questions, please feel free to reach out because um, they also implemented uh, an international worker policy, which was really great. Um, and they were able to support with some of those settlement needs of newcomers coming to Canada for the first three months. So, you know, they were able to give money for groceries for their first time, um, support with that those PPE costs, things like that. So that was also a really good initiative that they started. So um, what's next, whether you're an employer or uh, a community, um, RDN would love to, to support you with, um, you know, some tools and resources. So um, in the past 18 months, we were able to run a program called Ready. And that's the employers, um, rural employers awareness on diversity and inclusion. So it's workplace training for employers to be able to understand the needs of their newcomers, uh, learn some really good policies and practices that they can implement to help retain their staff. Um, and there's really good uh, tools and resources in the in uh, the training. We published the toolkit with all the training resources and materials. Um, so please feel free to reach out to me if you'd like a copy of this. Um, but on the side, we're also doing uh, live facilitated training sessions, both virtually and in person, to be able to support employers. So this is actually funded by the Government of Canada. And we're, um, we're doing virtual sessions. So if you're a really busy employer and you only have two hours uh, and you want to do a session, we offer recorded sessions and live sessions. But we also have the opportunity to come to your community, to come to your organization, to sit down with your staff, um, and to help you learn. 
So regardless of what you're looking to learn, whether it's the Canadian immigration system, the hiring process. So, um, you know, that's from the job uh, advertisement to the recruitment process, to the interview process. We can help you establish some good policies um, to go over some unconscious bias in your organization, whether it's, you know, doing community engagement and doing that advocacy piece with your community or your staff to show why it's important to hire newcomers or help welcome them. We do that as well. So this is a free opportunity for your community if you're interested or you're in your organization. Uh, we'd love to work together. Um, some other ways that we support as a rural immigration team, um, we do anti-racism and discrimination training. So often um, we've done things in Hinton actually uh, and with schools as well. So talking to children about you know, what is racism? What is discrimination? Uh, at a very basic level, just to have those uncomfortable conversations, um, which has actually been really successful uh, for school-aged children. Uh, we do EDI training, capacity building. We support with policy development um, and customized training as well. So if you're a workplace, uh, for instance, the healthcare industry, and you're about to hire some new healthcare aides or workers, um, and you want some training, we often do that as well. Um, specific to, you know, what you're looking for. Uh, it's customizable. And we support with diverse newcomer populations. So whether it's, you know, Ukrainian evacuees, whether it's people from Syria coming in, whether it's people from Afghanistan, we're able to help you support different specific newcomer populations, understanding what their needs are, and some innovative tools and practices that you can do to create more welcoming and inclusive communities and organizations. So that's it for me. Um, I'd love to open the floor to any comments or questions that you might have. Um, yeah, thank you so much for, for spending some time with me this morning. Well, I don't see any questions right now. Um, maybe answer them all, or maybe they just need to kind of browse through some of that information. It was a lot of information that was so amazing. So I really appreciate that. Um, definitely great case studies. Great to hear about some of the communities as well. I know some of the folks are on here who are from those communities. So that's also really cool to see them highlighted. Um, yeah, so I just want to thank you so much, Sahela, for all of that information and um, sharing all the work that you do. Um, I know that, you know, the more information we have, the better equipped we are to support efforts. Um, oh, there is a question there. So how can we get a copy of the Rural Employer Diversity Toolkit? Yeah, absolutely. You can send me an email and I can send it directly to you. Um, I believe there's also a link on our website that you can go to um, to download the toolkit as well. Perfect. All right. And I see Carrie has her hand up as well. Carrie, do you want to ask your question? Yes. In one of your earlier slides, you said that you had Indigenous um, uh, statistics, kind of. I don't know how you explained it. It went by pretty quickly. But um, <laughs> it was it was lumped under Indigenous. Were there any specific Métis uh, stats that you had? Um, I believe you're referring to Indigenous data collection. Yes. Um, I'm to be honest, I'm not 100% sure, um, okay. but I would I would love to connect you to a member of our team. Um, awesome. I'd love yeah. to be connected. <laughs> Absolutely. They, okay. They've been, yeah, but they've been doing a lot of really, really incredible work with uh, different Indigenous communities. So okay. um, I'd love to to send your information over. Or yeah, I'll, put my ch I'll put my email address in the chat. Okay. Perfect. Thanks so much, Carrie. Um, so how can we connect with Newcomer Support Team? Absolutely. So um, RDN actually doesn't work directly with newcomers, but we work with really that secondary resource that can work with service providers or employers. Um, but if you wanted to connect with me um, and you're looking for supports directly, we have a lot of really good partnerships with different settlement agencies across Alberta. So um, I'd be more than willing to make the introduction for you. Or if you were hoping to learn more about our services, um, that would be, we can uh, connect as well. I'm just going to put my email in the chat here. Um, so if anyone has any questions at all or wants any resources, please feel free to email me and I'd love to, to connect further. Thank you. Um, if you want to learn more, if you'd like, love us to come and do a presentation for your organizations or communities, feel free to reach out because we'd love to, to keep doing this work. And thank you so much to our Pat for, for having me. There is one more, um, it, just a question about blanket ceremonies. Do you have, do you conduct those? Do you have connections for them? Right. We actually, um, Deborah, we don't do them. However, we, we've we done one with our organization. So we definitely have the, the connections to be able to facilitate that uh, and refer you. 
And thank you so much for everyone joining us. Um, and so, Hala, if there are any other questions that um, come through, I'll just forward those or Lindsay can forward them your way. Sounds good. Thanks, Alicia. Thank you. Thank you.